some of the many, oh, sorry, uh, let me just uh, continue. To, you know, to talk about some of the many uh, artists, Italian artists who worked on the Capitol, to really cover them all, uh, even a three-month uh, college course wouldn't do it justice, so uh, let alone 45 minutes. So I'm going to touch on just some of the most notable contributions, uh, as we talked about in the description as well. So let me get right to the agenda. I will move fast through these slides. Uh, you know, I am from New York. I've been called many things in my life, but slow is not one of them. So uh, let me get to the agenda, and we'll move forward. So first, I want to share with you a little brief personal history just to uh, convey how a uh, kind of a shy, scrawny uh, Sicilian kid from Brooklyn ended up at the U.S. Capitol. And then I'll talk a little bit about the Capitol construction history. I think that'll inform our discussion about the artists later on. And most notably, the design philosophy is key because the Capitol could have easily taken a more austere approach. In fact, many members of Congress did not want any rich ornamentation of the Capitol. They didn't want to be anything like those kings and queens and royalty throughout Europe. I mean, we were supposed to be different from that, and they wanted to take a much more austere approach. I'm glad some egos that were involved uh, who had been to Europe and had seen the great and beautiful grandeur in Europe and beauty there uh, did want some of that for the Capitol to help us establish ourselves, to make ourselves be present and to really put ourselves on the national stage as well, that we had arrived. And, uh, and again, why Italian artists and sculptors were involved in that process? Why not American sculptors and artists? You know, there were a lot of members of Congress that were upset that we were bringing these immigrants in to work on our capital. And I'll talk about that a little bit later as well. And then finally, we'll look at the artists and the sculptors and their works as well. And primarily the three main uh, visitor spaces, the building exterior, which everybody vis that any visitor can see, uh, National Statuary Hall, which was the original house chamber, and the rotunda. These are the two principal visitor spaces on any tour that we provide in the Capitol. And then I'll stay around as long as necessary for a Q&A. I could talk about the Capitol all night. <laughs> So let me start with my brief personal history. Uh, this, if anyone knows, is Bay Ridge, Brooklyn. This is my hometown. I grew up in the shadow of the Verrazano Bridge. If you're not familiar with uh, Bay Ridge, it was actually the filming location for Saturday Night Fever. Uh, there's John Travolta. So that was filmed in my neighborhood the year we were leaving in 1977. And uh, I grew up in uh, an apartment building on the fourth floor. My brothers and I, I have two brothers, we're all one year apart. We grew up in the same bedroom for 13 years. So we learned along to get, learned to get along very well by necessity, and uh, even 45 years later, I have to say we're still each other's best friends because of it. Uh, first job out of college, uh, well, actually my third job out of college, was with the federal government uh, in the federal building in New York City on Broadway, the Jacob Javits building on the 21st floor. I got a job with the Army Corps of Engineers as a public affairs specialist. I wanted that job so badly, I hand-delivered my resume, and long story short, I started working that afternoon because of a crisis that was going on in the office and the uh, boss there needed some help. So that really helped me get that job, and I don't think I'd be here today had I not made that trip that day to bring my resume to that building. Uh, today would be different because everything's online. Anyway, I started working for the Corps as a public affairs specialist doing public affairs promotions and communications for beach erosion projects, military construction, harbor, const uh, harbor construction, uh, flood control. That's actually me right there, knee deep in flood waters in Wayne, New Jersey, if anyone's familiar with that area. They have flooding very frequently. And my job was to uh, take pictures and get slides so that our colonels could show members of Congress why we needed to spend you know, millions of dollars on flood walls and levees and other projects to help justify our existence, so to speak. And after eight years with the Corps in New York, the Corps offered me a job in uh, Virginia at the Pentagon, and uh, they were offering to move me down there as well. They needed a communications officer at the Pentagon because the Army Corps of Engineers, Baltimore District, was about to start renovating the Pentagon. And if you know anything about that building, maybe some of you work there, it's six and a half million square feet, 23,000 people work in that building. And every square foot of that building needed to be gutted at some point in time. And that meant we had to remove and relocate 23,000 people. And that's no easy task, especially the ones with the stars on their shoulders. So my job is to make sure all that went smoothly as possible from a communications standpoint. And it was a lot of fun. Every few weeks, I got a chance to fly up in a helicopter, go around the Pentagon, take pictures of all our project activities. And I would use those photographs for a newsletter, for our website, and for displays inside the Pentagon, again, to make sure everyone was informed of what was going on and when they were going to have to be relocated. 
Here's a photograph of me pointing to a window in a newly renovated space in the Pentagon, not quite finished as you can see in the ceiling there. But my job once we started renovating spaces was to show all the tenants in the building, that's all the military groups, the Army, Air Force, Marines, uh, what and the Navy, what was going to happen, what, what they can expect in their new spaces. And here I am pointing to a blast resistant window, talking about how much it weighed, that it weighed 2000 pounds. And when I uh, left a couple years later, one of my staff, he used this image to show his kind of uh, Italian spin on, on my discussion here, talking about the weight of the windows. It says, this blast resistant window right here weighs more than Aunt Sophia after four calzones, two plates of pasta and a lasagna. Now, I did not say those words to that military army group there, but uh, it was kind of his barb at my uh, Sicilian heritage. So uh, I took thousands of pictures at the Pentagon. My job, again, was to make sure everyone knew what was going on. And on, uh, you know, but eventually, uh, after five years there, I got an offer at the Capitol to be the communications director for a new project there called the Capitol Visitor Center Construction Project. And so on September 10th, 2001, I told my boss at the Pentagon, that I accepted a job at the Capitol. And you all know what happened the next day. The planes hit New York and the Pentagon. And it was an airplane, by the way, that did hit the Pentagon. That's part of the uh, casing for one of the jet engines there. I have a piece of that airplane with me as well that I kept with me for 20 years now. Uh, and uh, so instead of coming to the Capitol at the end of September, I stayed on the craft site for the better part of two and a half months. And my job there was to deal with all the media to make sure everyone knew what was happening. There was no shortage of media from the country and around the world. I was dealing with 60 media calls a day. Uh, and giving them sometimes even some sidewalks once we are allowed access into the building after the FBI was done with their investigation three weeks later. And here I am, uh, not with a COVID mask, this is 20 years earlier, uh, wearing a mask and a Tyvek suit. That was how I had to get into the building because there was mold throughout the building. Because when the planes hit, they triggered our sprinkler system and the sprinkler systems, you know, uh, completely saturated all the carpeting in the building. And that created a mold situation because it incubated for two weeks until we could access the building. So it was really quite an experience there. I never expected graduating as an English major, going into public affairs, that I'd be wearing a Tyvek suit to get to work and a gas mask as well. Uh, here I am in the center giving a tour to the UN Secretary General and other dignitaries from the United Nations. Everyone from uh, around the world wanted to come and see the site to show their support for the United States. And that was a real privilege for me to show them this is the actual impact zone where that plane entered the building. And then finally, I did get my way to the Capitol, and uh, there was a series of pictures that were taken to me by Tom Williams uh, for Getty Images. He was with Roll Call. Uh, and from the very early days of the Capitol Visitor Center project, I was giving site walks, showing people what was going to happen before anything actually happened. And then once something started to happen, uh, I would able to talk about it. Here I'm giving a C-SPAN presentation. If you want to go on YouTube and look at that, it's about an hour-long presentation. If you want more torture, <laughs> you can enjoy that. Uh, I was on the site every day in the trenches, talking to contractors, learning about the capital, learning about the geology, the tree preservation efforts, historic preservation. It was really a lot of fun because I got to learn so much about so many different topics. Here I'm giving a tour to a senator's a, a son's class. I did a lot of special favors for members of Congress. A senator Manchin had me on his speed dial. He called me quite frequently for special tours for his family. There I am looking like an FBI agent giving a tour to Congressman Jim Moran, some of you might remember that name, and some other members of Congress as well. And here I am now actually in the trench of the Capitol Visitor Center. We're dug down about 15 feet deep. This is staff from the Speaker's Office. At the time, it was uh, Congressman Dennis Hastert. Some of you might remember that name. He was the Speaker of the House in the early 2000s there. And I was giving up to 15 site walks a day, 60 a month, or about 700 a year. And before you knew it, I was given, had given over 4,000 site walks uh, of the Capitol. This is one of my highlights, having given a tour to the Vice President of the United States at the time, Dick Cheney, just before we opened our doors in 2008. So uh, enough about me. The Capitol Visitors Center finally opened. And this was just a couple of years ago in June. We were welcoming up to 16,000 people a day. This is our main entrance hall. This is inside the building of the Visitor Center. Uh, you cannot see one square foot of the floor. You can imagine how crowded it was. And keep in mind, before we had opened our doors, Every one of these people would have been online that would have lasted four hours long outside. 
So it was very rewarding to even see these crowds in a climate controlled environment where there were 50 water fountains available to them, a cafeteria, exhibit space, and they could wait for their tour for the Capitol in better conditions there. I hope to see this again someday. I've already been told by my colleagues at the Capitol that because of COVID, because of the attack on January 6th, that tours might be limited to only 15 people instead of 50 or 60 people. That means instead of 2.4 million people a year, we might be only welcoming five or 600,000 people a year. I think that would be a sad thing to see though. Here's an interesting quote by John Adams 200 years ago. In my many years, I have come to the conclusion that one useless man is a shame, two is a law firm, and three or more is a Congress. Now, I know that's disparaging to Congress, and I point out that Congress has disparaged oftentimes, especially in the media and by many people across the country. But in my experience there, I've really been proud to work with them, at least in their uh, perspective to the building. They care about the Capitol building, they care about its history, they care about the, uh, the arc and architecture and the architectural palette of the building. They wanted to make sure that when we built a new visitor center or did any changes to the Capitol, that we were respectful to that history. So say what you want about them. They were very in tune and intimately involved in the construction of the visitor center. So here's the Capitol in the center. I hope you can all see my mouse moving. The Capitol is the center, figuratively and literally in the heart of the city within the city. Up here on the top is the Senate office buildings, the Supreme Court, the Library of Congress, three buildings there, and the House office buildings. All combined, I should point out, this is 17 and a half million square feet of building space. That's three times the size of the Pentagon in terms of actual office space. So my boss, the architect of the Capitol, was making sure that all of these buildings were remained functional and all the tenants, especially those members of Congress, all 535 of them, were happy. <laughs> It's also important to remember that the Capitol is a national stage. When people come to the building, this is the inauguration of Donald Trump. This is a police ceremony during Police Week in May of 1998. Well, this is the burial of Rosa Parks. She lay in honor in the Capitol. And 30 people have lain in state or in honor in the Capitol. It's where we have our state funerals. Unveilings of statues here. Here's Dwight Eisenhower unveiled from Kansas. And here's uh, Helen Keller from Alabama being unveiled about 10 years ago in the Capitol. These are gold medal ceremonies. I had a chance to meet John Glenn that day when he received a gold medal, Arnold Palmer as well. And this is uh, Martin Luther King's family receiving a medal on his behalf posthumously about seven years ago. And this is one of the 40,000 tours our capital guides give every year. We had 60 guides at the visitor center who have been quite dormant the last year. They're just itching for the capital to reopen again. But two and a half million people a year would see the capital and one out of every three of our visitors was people from around the world, from Europe especially. So not only was the Capitol their first impression of Congress, but it's the first impression of our country. So we wanted to make sure that we represented the country very well. Now, one thing to note about our capital city in Washington, D.C. in general, is that it wasn't a city when it became a capital. It was built from the ground up. Unlike Paris and Rome and London, these were all cities that became their country's capitals, unlike D.C., which was really a city in name only. This is what our city looked like back in 1790 when Congress decided to leave Philadelphia in 10 years and come to the Capitol in 1800. A city in name only. This is the Potomac River here in the center looking south. Capitol Hill would be up here on the left. So you can imagine why Congress didn't want to come here. There were no roads. There were no taverns. There were no hotels, no libraries, no restaurants, no amenities for them. Uh, streets didn't have names on them. They had to walk past pigs and cattle to get to work. They even had to share their beds in the few lodgings, sometimes sharing rooms with five or six other members of Congress. And according to some of their lease agreements, they had to share their beds with travelers. <laughs> so they did not like it here. Uh, they would have rather stayed in Philadelphia, where there was 100,000 people living, or in New York, or Pennsylvania, or, or, or Boston, or even in Charleston. Uh, but Congress, I think, made the smart decision to move to the, this neutral site in Washington, D.C., so that they would not appear beholden to any state or any region. And it's also interesting when Pierre L'Enfant designed the city, he originally had the site of the White House or the President's House, which was called, up on the hill and the Capitol would be at a lower ground. But George Washington, to his credit, said, no, let the Capitol be on higher ground because it should be the center of the city. And unlike other countries where the king's castle is literally and figuratively the highest in the land because the king is the most important, it was in, you know, here the people serve, here the people's house is most important. So it was put up on the hill and not the president's mansion.
So again, here we are, and now we've got this city, we've got to build it. How do we create a capital? Well, Thomas Jefferson had the idea of having a competition, but unfortunately there were no trained architects in our country. So the submissions were very weak to say the least. Uh, the renderings were very poor and amateurish. You can look at some of these drawings. These were drawings for the United States Capitol, submissions in a contest. There were 16 of them all together and none of them met the uh, approval of George Washington who lamented about their amateurishness and their uh, you know, inadequacies. Look at this one with the, he said, is that an eagle on the building or is that a turkey? This was a submission by James Diamond. Suffice it to say, this is not win the competition. Now, Thomas Jefferson, I like to thank God for Thomas Jefferson because he had traveled through Europe. He had been to Rome and Paris and he had seen the great buildings throughout Europe where George Washington had never left our country, had never been to Europe. But Jefferson brought back those influences. He said, I want something more grand. Let's have a dome over our Capitol building. This is a close up of that rendering that he had sketched. Interestingly enough, after the competition ended, there was a late submission that came in after the deadline. It was by Dr. William Thorne of Nevis, the island of Nevis in the Caribbean. And this was his rendering. Beautifully done, beautifully drafted. And you can see incredibly how it echoes what Jefferson had in mind, a central dome with a colonnade facade. You see the colonnade facade here in the center. Now look at that rendering again, a dome with a colonnade facade. And so of course that won the competition and Dr. William Thornton came to America. He got a $500 prize and a plot of land in Washington, DC. George Washington here on September 18th, 1793, walked up Pennsylvania dirt road to lay the cornerstone. He was the Grand Masonic Master of the Lodge of Alexandria, number 22, which is still around today. And he laid the cornerstone that day. Now, seven years later, by the year 1800, this was the capital that was finished. No dome, no house wing, just the North Wing. So the House and the Senate, the Library, Congress, the Supreme Court all had to meet in that small North Wing. Uh, you can imagine some of the interesting uh, tensions that occurred during those times. Now here's the capital in the background, the north wing on the left here, that's the Senate wing and the house wing. This is around 1815 timeframe. Uh, I'd like to acknowledge the contributions of the slaves who worked on the Capitol. I didn't know about this story until I started working at the Capitol. I didn't learn about it in high school, but it was the slaves who cleared the grounds and cut the trees and quarried the stone and baked the bricks and sharpened the tools on and on and on. They did fine carpentry, even some of them, and even some of the stonework as well. They didn't get recognition until we actually built the visitor center and recognized them in our orientation film. But you see the Capitol is still unfinished. And this essentially would be the Capitol that was burnt down by the British in 1814. Finally, when it was rebuilt by 1826, this is the capital the way it looked at that time. Now, this photograph is from 1846. It's the earliest known photograph we have of the capital. It shows a wooden copper dome. And I say 1826 here because the capital hadn't changed in 20 years since it was completed uh, 20 years before the photo was taken. Maybe some of the trees are a little taller than they would have been 20 years earlier. Uh, again, a wooden copper dome that was about 120 feet high on the outside to really match the proportions on the building. But inside, the dome is only 96 feet high. And let me show a circle there. 96 feet high. Is there anything thing symbolic about 96? Not really. But the fact is that that height matched the 96 foot width of the rotunda. It was as high as it was wide. And that kind of brings us to our first Italian influence on the capital, uh, besides the architecture itself, which is kind of this neoclassical Corinthian capital columns and so forth. Uh, but inside, it was equal proportions. Why? Because the Pantheon in Rome uh, if you've ever been there, an incredible structure, still the longest lasting functional structure in the world from 80 AD. It is still serving for functions. It is 142 feet high by 142 feet wide, much larger than our capital dome in terms of the original dome, but equal proportions. It was those equal proportions, that symbol of unity and continuity and eternity, which we were trying to establish with our country by using these kind of, you know, old illusions from Rome and from Greece. Which brings us now to our first sculptor, Luigi Persico. He was born in Naples in 1791. Uh, he had a, no a number of notable contributions in the capital. Let me get right to them. The first one is here in the center, this pediment here. It's called the Genius of America. Let me zoom in on that. It shows America in the center. She is pointing toward justice, but looking back toward hope. 
Whenever you see a figure of a woman with an anchor below it, that's an allegorical figure symbolizing hope. We're anchored in hope. But she is also, again, looking at justice holding the scales. Justice is holding the Constitution. It says September 17th, 1787. So basically what this is trying to convey is that while we hope for a prosperous future, we move forward looking toward justice as well. So uh, again, this has been here since 1826. This was redone in marble when the Capitol was extended in 19. 63, the original sandstone had weathered poorly and so was recreated in marble. Now, also on the east front of the Capitol, Luigi Persco added two more sculptures. And let me point to these arrows here, a sculpture of peace and war. And I'll zoom in on those as well. Beautiful sculptures of a woman, allegorical figure. This is Ceres, the goddess of agriculture, representing peace, and Mars, the god of war, representing war here as well. Beautiful pieces by Persico. Uh, these, again, also were done in, redone in marble, uh, and the original plaster uh, sculptures that he had done really have disappeared over time. But the models were taken, molds were taken, and these were recreated from those original sculptures. Now let's get to another sculpture by new artists, the Pichirilli brothers. I'll talk about them in a second. This is the pediment over the house wing. Again, we're talking about the exterior of the building still now. It's called the Apotheosis of Democracy. And uh, let me uh, talk about the Pichirilli brothers. Never heard of them before until I worked at the Capitol, but they were quite notable accomplishments they've made. And I'll talk about them. They were from Massa, Italy. They immigrated here in the early 1900s. All six brothers lived together in a brownstone in the Bronx. And within a matter of months, they were getting commissions for sculptures from a number of places in New York City. Uh, but then in 1916, they got a, the commission to do the pediment over the house wing, the apotheosis of democracy there. Let me show you a little detail of the work there. It really is gorgeous. Now, these were all been done separately. They're then installed as separate pieces for this 60 foot long sculpture. And this woman in the center represents peace. And uh, she is holding her arm over the little boy representing genius of America. He's holding a torch representing eternity. And to the left and right are symbols of industry and agriculture showing the two main economic sources of our country. And uh, really a beautiful sculpture that uh, 100 years later has really stood the test of time. Now, I mentioned that the Pichirilli brothers did many other notable accomplishments. And maybe you'll recognize some of these as I show you the pictures. That's right, the Lincoln at the Lincoln Memorial, a massive structure done by Daniel Chester French, who did the clay model, but then the brothers did it in stone. And notice the bundles of rods below Abraham Lincoln's fingers here coming down on the chair. I'm going to talk about those a little bit later. They also did the pediment over the New York Stocks Exchange, very similar to the one over the Capitol. The big arch at Washington Square Park in, in New York City, near uh, NYU, New York University. The big lines in front of the New York Public Library as well. And here's one I think you may have all seen as well, the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier at Arlington National Cemetery. So really a remarkable accomplishment for those brothers and many, many more. I encourage you to look them up online and you'll see a list of their accomplishments. Now let's talk about Enrico Cosici, uh, again, born in Verona, Italy, died in Havana, Cuba, where he retired to. Uh, he was a sculptor who did many works in the United States, uh, primarily at the Capitol between 23 and 1827. In a four year period, he did a number of pieces, including uh, one of his most notable piece, which was in National Statuary Hall, which was the original house chamber. So again, members of Congress met here until 1857. Eventually, the space got too small and they moved into the new wing. And this room became really a vacant space that I often talked about on my tour. If any of you took a tour with me, as soon as Congress vacated it and took all their furniture, that space became a flea market inside the Capitol. People came in to sell their wares, fruit, uh, pottery, flowers, even some livestock was being sold inside the Capitol. Uh, eventually, in 1859, they turned it into a statuary hall. And uh, that's what it looks like today. Statues flanked the entire perimeter of the room, about 35 of the 100 state statues. There are two statues from every state inside the Capitol, and 35 are in this room alone. But I want to bring your attention to the statue up on the top left there. This is really the first Statue of Liberty to appear in the country, preceding the Statue of Liberty in New York by about 70 years. So let's take a closer look at it. It really is a beautiful piece. Uh, it is the composition is. Uh, the woman representing liberty, handing out the Constitution to Congress, flanked by the American Eagle representing the strength of our country, and, and a snake on the right surrounding a bundle of rods. Let's take a closer look at that. Uh, 
first of all, I want to point out this is still the original plaster model that he intended to be converted into marble. But unfortunately, Enrico Cosici died before he could make that conversion. So it's still the original plaster. And the architect of the Capitol staff, some of my colleagues would have to go up there every six months to really uh, recoat the plaster with a, a coat of wax to make sure it could withstand the humidity from all the thousands of people that traverse the room below. Notice again that bundle of rods there. I like to talk about that theme throughout the Capitol. You'll see that motif in dozens, if not hundreds, of locations throughout the Capitol. Uh, the speaker's mace is a bundle of rods tied together. It's a symbol that in unity, there is strength. One stick you can break, but when you tie them together, it is very strong. Uh, in the speaker's uh, rostrum in the house chamber, flanking the flag to the left and right are bundles of rods. Let's look closer at that. You can see that very clearly there. Again, bundle of rods tied together, and there's the speaker's mace. Another location, George Washington at Richmond and in the Capitol, the duplicate of the original statue, he's leaning on a bundle of rods. It is also a, civic, uh, a symbol of civic authority as well. In the rotunda where there are eight large 18 foot wide paintings, the frames which are made out of pine covered with 22 karat gold leaf are flanked by bundles of rods as well. You can see that here. So again, it's a very subtle theme, but if you look carefully, I like to uh, do scavenger hunt with kids and they have to come up with 10 locations where they see the bundles of rods and it doesn't take them more than 15 minutes to find those. Now, I do want to talk about another Italian artist who gets very little mention in the history books, and that's Giuseppe Vallaperta. He is responsible for that eagle below the composition. It's kind of an awkward composition to have an eagle below another eagle. Uh, I don't know what Congress was thinking or what they were thinking at the design. Let me zoom in on that. And Congress derided this eagle very publicly. They said that it looked like a member of Congress in an eagle suit. <laughs> and unfortunately, that derision reached the newspapers and Giuseppe Vallaperta, try as he may have had, he did not get another commission after completing this eagle. And two years later, sadly, he committed suicide, born by the poverty uh, from, this, uh, from this sculpture here. Actually, I think it's more successful than the eagle uh, that's up here, but uh, Congress derided it, and unfortunately that was the demise of Giuseppe Vallaperta. Now let's move into the rotunda, where we see some more of Enrico Cosici's work, not in the paintings, but in these panels along the perimeter. There are 16 of them uh, throughout the rotunda and some insets over the doorway. So let's look at a couple that he worked on. This is a bas relief of Christopher Columbus that he did. And there are reliefs also of Cabot, of Raleigh, and La Salle, other explorers, but those were done by other artists. Here's another relief he did in the rotunda of the Pilgrim's Landing. Notice that the Native American here is lower than the Pilgrim. It was important to Congress that the white people were always higher than the Native Americans. There is not one really positive depiction of Native Americans inside the Capitol. It was really until 1897 when the Library of Congress introduced more positive images of Native Americans. And here's another image, oh, sorry about that, of, uh, of Daniel Boone having a confrontation with the Native Americans. Congress did not like this image because the Native American is actually a little bit taller than Daniel Boone, but you can see below their feet the subjugation of the Native Americans there. I've given tours to Native American groups, including a senator, Ben Nighthorse Campbell, who was the Senate Appropriations Leader once. He was a very uh, you know, uh, proud Native American, had a long ponytail, he drove in to work on a Harley Davidson every, work, every day. Uh, he asked for the removal of many of these sculptures and even some of the paintings in the Capitol. And while I appreciate that sentiment, uh, you know, these are in stone, these are part of the walls of the Capitol, it would have been very sad, but I think it also tells a story about the sentiments at this point in time. And, and I know a lot of people have different opinions on it, but I'm glad they remain. And I'm glad to tell the story about that as well. Here's Pocahontas protecting Captain John Smith. This was done by Antonio Capilano. Uh, he had a couple major contributions, this one being one of them, and another one I'll talk about in a second. Uh, but he had done a lot of work. He immigrated here to earn some money, and then he went back home and was able to live very well. It said that he retired to Uno Piccolo Palazzo back in Florence uh, and actually spent some time with other American artists back in, uh, in Italy. Another work he did is right over the doors on the east front, 
And it's important to remember that the east front of the Capitol is the front of the building, not the west front where the inaugurations occur. I know there are those grand staircases, grand, grand staircases there, but that really is the backyard of the Capitol. The east front was the main approach to the Capitol building, only 36 steps instead of 83 on the other side. You can imagine Congress not wanting to climb up 83 steps every day to get to their offices. So, uh, and that's why the statue on top of the dome actually faces toward the east, not the west, because she is facing toward the front of the building. But there's a sculpture right above the central doorway there. It's called Fame and Peace Crowning George Washington. This is another one of Antonio Capilano's contributions there. And you see Fame trumpeting his glory, peace here with the laurel wreaths, and there's George Washington in the center. And that remains there today. Now, my favorite sculptor and contributor, contributor to the Capitol, his Italian contributor to the Capitol is Carlo Franzoni by far. As much as I love the work of Constantino Brumidi, there's a sculpture that he has done that I'm going to show you now that I think is really the finest in the Capitol. And it's even praised by Congress as considering the best sculpture in the Capitol. It's something that I think even Michelangelo would have been proud of. Again, he was from Carrara, Italy, and my wife and I went there about uh, I, well, several years ago now, maybe 10 years ago now. Uh, really remarkable. Uh, you, look, you think you're looking at snow when you're looking at these mountains, but it really is white marble being quarried off of the sides of those mountains there. And the deeper you go down, the farther back in time you go. Michelangelo, as you may know, was working in these quarries and personally picked out pieces of stone for the David and the Pieta. And uh, I always like to give Michelangelo credit. I'm a, person, a great fan of Michelangelo. So let's move back inside the Capitol into National Statuary Hall, where Carlo Franzoni, I think, did the nicest sculpture in the Capitol. Again, this was the original hall of the house that became the Statuary Hall. We talked about the Statue of Liberty on the south side of the hall, but on the north side of the hall is another sculpture. And that is Cleo, the muse of history, riding in a chariot, moving through time. Let me zoom in on that. And there's a, one of our staffers of the architect of the Capitol actually fixing and setting the clock every time the hours move ahead. And they have to wind the clock every week as well. This clock itself is made by Simon Willard of Boston. He was the premier clockmaker in the country at that time. If you find anything with Simon Willard's name on it, any type of stopwatch or uh, pocket watch, uh, be sure to say that. I remember seeing one on, uh, it was an uh, Antiques Roadshow, a stopwatch someone had from Simon Willard, 250000 thousand dollars so, so it keeps very precise time but anyway if you look at the sculpture the composition it is Cleo the Muse of History she's holding a book and it looks as if she's writing even though there's no instrument there she is intended to be shown as writing in the book and moving through time on this chariot so what Carlo Franzoni was trying to do was tell members of Congress two important things he was saying one watch what you say because it is being recorded be prudent with the words you use and because the wheel of the chariot is a clock, he was also saying, and don't take too long to say what you need to say. Be prudent with your words and be prudent with the time you take to say them. So good words of wisdom, I think, even for anyone in any area of corporate business today, because some people like to ramble on, as I may be right now, as a matter of fact. Oh, a couple of interesting facts about this sculpture. Uh, first of all, the detail work is incredible. You look at the folds in her robes. Like I said, Michelangelo would be proud to call this one his own. Uh, and Carlo Franzoni, he was only 30 years old when he completed this, and he died just a few months later. I think of the myriad contributions he would have made had he not passed away so early. You know, Michelangelo lived to the year of 89, so he was able to make many, many more contributions. This is the detail of the Cleo's face. Look at the detail in the hair. You have to use a lot of fine picks to make the marble uh, do that and create that type of, of, of structure there in, in marble. A little interesting footnote on the car of history and the chariot that she's on is this bust of George Washington, this kind of relief. This is the first marble representation of George Washington to appear in our country. And there's fame trumpeting her, trumpeting the glory of George Washington there. Now, interesting thing about the composition, again, it may be canceled. Congress was thinking about removing the sculpture. Why? Because Cleo is writing while she's moving in this car. So technically, she's texting while driving. OK, that's a bad joke. Congress isn't really going to take the statue down, but it's a joke I like to share during the tours. All right, let's move into the old Supreme Court, uh, another great historic space in the Capitol. Carlo Franzoni did another important work. It's a very dark, dank space. The Supreme Court met here for 10 years from uh, 1800 to 1810. Then they would move upstairs until around 18, I'm sorry, until 1935. And then they finally moved across the street into their new building. This is uh, the justice holding the scales, flanked by an eagle protecting our laws. 
And Carla Franzoni represented America as the winged youth holding the constitution with a bright sun behind the winged youth showing the illumination and the genius of America there. But if you look closely at justice, for hundreds of years, for, for centuries, justice had always been shown wearing a blindfold. And why is justice supposed to be impartial? But Franzoni was saying that in his notes that he wanted to show justice as clear sighted and seeing all points of view, which is something we take pride of in America with our justice system as well. Now, keep in mind uh, the joke that often tour guides say in the in the Supreme Court is that justice couldn't see anyway. It was so dark she didn't need to wear a blindfold because of the dark lighting in that space was illuminated by candles and whale oil lamps most of the time. In fact, the Supreme Court justices hated it. The only windows were on the east side and by noon the sun was overhead and it was about this dark inside that space. Now outside the Supreme Court is this vestibule. Carlo Franzoni's brother Giuseppe Franzoni uh, made a notable contribution that still stands today, the most, uh, the, actually the oldest sculptural work really in the Capitol. And that's not these three busts back here. This is Kosciuszko and Pulaski. I'll talk about the center bust in a second. These were freedom fighters from the Revolutionary War and one from the 1850s. And again, I'll talk about him in a minute. But I want to point out to these columns here. These columns are the corn cob capital columns. You see the tops of them? They're not Corinthian capitals. They're corn cobs. And, you know, uh, Giuseppe Franzoni was able to sculpt those based on the, the wishes of the uh, architect at that time, Benjamin Henry Latrobe. And he, Giuseppe Franzoni did such a nice job with these column capitals that uh, ben, Benjamin Henry Latrobe, again, the architect, said to, to Thomas Jefferson in a letter, he said, Mr. Jefferson, I've earned many great praises for my beautiful spaces, my hall of the house and my Senate chambers, but nothing has earned me more applause from Congress than my corn cob capitals. So kind of interesting. Now let's look at this bust in the center there. That is none other than Giuseppe Garibaldi. So it's nice to have an Italian well represented in the capital in a very notable public space here. And this was done by another Giuseppe, Giuseppe Martinenga. Let me just move the screen here for a second here. And Martigani, he was an Italian sculptor. He was in Paris uh, working on this sculpture. Uh, he, he had studied in Venice originally, but then moved to Paris. But he was working on the sculpture here. Giuseppe Garibaldi is a, was you know the one who unified Italy in the 1840s, early 1850s. And uh, so it's great to see him represented in the capital. Now, as time moved on from the 1820s through the 1850s, the capital was getting too small. Why? Because the country kept getting bigger. More and more states were being added to the Union. You know, we had the Great Compromise, uh, you know, California, other states were being added to the Union, and yet the capital wasn't getting any bigger. So members of Congress were getting, you know, more congested inside their spaces. So they decided to extend the building to the north and to the south. And welcome Thomas U. Walter to the Capitol. He was the architect of the Capitol who designed this beautiful dome and these wonderful extensions. This is pretty much the Capitol that you see today, with the exception that this entire east front would be extended 32 feet in the 1960s to add another 100,000 square feet to the Capitol. But these wings, you know, were large spaces, more than tripling the size of the Capitol. Uh, and again, the dome raised up to match the proportion of the now 750 foot long Capitol. Beautiful renderings that Walter did showing the dome, the inner dome and the outer dome as well, kind of a dome within a dome, very similar to the original dome. And the rotunda now still remained the same. And by the way, notice this sandstone. This would have all been painted white by the 1840s to make it look like marble, but it was stripped down in 1905 to reveal the original stone again. Uh, there were darks and lights. Notice this light stone here. Why not put that light stone over here where the stone was lighter? Well, again, the architect of the capital at the time, his name was Bullfinch, he would have said, Tom, I don't care what the stone looks like. I'm going to paint it all white anyway. Had he known the stone would have been revealed, he might have been more selective with the stones he used, including stones with large rust deposits you see here and over here as well. So that is the original sandstone from the 1820s in the rotunda of the capital. Now, the capital continued, well, the construction was occurring in 1857, 58, and so forth. But in, in 1861, something happened. What happens? Right, the Civil War breaks out and everything stops. The government's funding for the capital com stops completely. Now, there was a contractor from Brooklyn that was helping to build the dome, and they kept building the dome even the height of the war. 
inside the rotunda. The, the rotunda was being housed here by Union Army soldiers. They were taking breaks there. They were lounging out there. You can see the paintings being covered by tarps. Above the Capitol uh, rotunda was just tarps hanging because there was no roof there. And by the time the war began, very soon thereafter, the rotunda became a hospital. Almost 200 cots were set up in the rotunda. Can you imagine if you walk through that space and some of you have been there to imagine that it was a hospital at some point where Union Army soldiers were being tended to. Meanwhile, the rotunda, the dome was being constructed by the Brooklyn contractor because they had $100,000 worth of cast iron outside. And they thought if they left it there, it would be stolen by, this, by the Confederate soldiers. So they kept building the dome, even though there was no guarantee that the Union would prevail or that they would ever get paid. And Abraham Lincoln saw the Capitol going on and he took heart and he said this famous quote, if the people see the Capitol going on, it's a sign that we intend the Union shall go on. And he used that kind of as a public affairs ploy, even though, the government did stop funding for the capital. It was the, really the fortitude of that contractor from Brooklyn, my hometown, to keep, keep working on the dome. And finally, by 1865, the capital was completed. And look at the grounds, how stark they are, very little ornamentation, still a lot of work. There's a horse and buggy right there out in front of the capital there. Uh, and this is the capital that, again, that Congress moved back into after the Civil War. And the spaces inside were very dark and dank, and the rotunda certainly had no ornamentation at the time. And thank heavens for Montgomery Miggs. He was the chief engineer of the capital construction. He had traveled through Italy and was very impressed by all the frescoes he had seen there. And that's what he wanted from the capital. And uh, by the way, he also did serve as the quartermaster general for the Union Army, making sure all of the armies uh, you know, up and down the coast had their supplies that they needed and was very instrumental in the victory of the North, Northern uh, Conquest. Now, the thing about Meigs is that he, again, wanted frescoes, but Congress said, no, we were, if we just got through a war, we have no money. But he, he said, you know, let me work on it. Let me see if I can find some cheap artists. And so he really uh, encouraged artists to come from Italy who were, you know, starving over there. There wasn't much after the, uh, after the revolutionary movements there. And, uh, you know, for about uh, 50 cents a day, he was able to hire sculptors and artists to work in the Capitol. Because quite frankly, there were no American artists and sculptors who could do the type of work that you would see throughout Europe, especially in the Vatican. Let me move forward here. And he, this is a quote I like to cite, our public buildings are starved in simple, starved in simple whitewash. In other words, they're just so bland that this is not the impression we want to make to our citizens and to the world. So welcome Constantino Brumidi. He's the most notable artist in the capital, including, I mean, he was even considered the artist of the capital. Some refer to him as the Michelangelo of the capital. He actually even did some sculptural work himself. Uh, he came to the capital in 1855. He grew up in Rome right around the perimeter of the forum in a coffee shop that's still there today. I haven't been able to visit it myself, but I, I do want to make a trek there. And uh, he lived upstairs with his parents. And uh, he went to the school at the Academia di San Luca, uh, St. Luke's Academy, which is still around today, a very notable uh, uh, school for sculpture and for painting. And he learned how to fresco paint, especially that was his forte. And I'm sure you all know fresco in Italian means fresh. You have to paint on fresh plaster. The plaster is supplied usually about an eighth of an inch thick, sometimes a little thinner, sometimes a little thicker, depending on what the subsurface is. And then you've got about five hours to complete your painting before that plaster dries. And the beauty of fresco painting is that when the paint dries, it dries inside the wall. It's not on the wall. So it really could last for centuries, as you see in Michelangelo's Sistine Chapel, and the colors don't fade. The only problem is if you make a mistake, you can't repaint it. You can't plaster over it. You have to scratch off that plaster and redo it. So you've got to have special skills to execute a plaster painting there. And, you know, it was Brumidi learned his skills and then worked in the Vatican. And he worked on paintings that Raphael had done. And he touched up and repaired many of the works by other great masters throughout the Vatican. And it was those skills he brought to the, ca to the capital. Now, in 1850, with the revolutionary movement going on throughout Europe. Here is, uh, you know, one of the leaders in Venice there. Uh, of course, the leader of it all was, you know, Giuseppe Garibaldi leading for the, the revolution and the unification. There was protests against the Pope. Uh, they didn't like having, the, having to answer to the Pope for everything. So a lot of liberal uh, people, you know, started protesting. And that's when this revolution began. Now, Brumidi, in his haste to protect some of the paintings from vandals during the revolutionary movement, stole the paintings from the churches and hid them in a monastery, and actually several monasteries. And after the Pope was restored to Rome, to Rome I'm sorry, uh, Brumidi was accused of theft. 
and he had to face 18 years in prison. Uh, now, he had the choice of either doing that or leaving the country entirely. So what's the choice you would make? So he comes to America rather than facing 18 years in prison, and he stumbles into New York in 1852, quickly earns a commission at St. Stephen's Church in New York to do an altarpiece, which is still there today. I confess I haven't been there myself, but I'm definitely going to be going there the next time I go to New York because I keep forgetting to do that. Uh, and that fresco earned him a lot of praise and some notoriety in even a newspaper, which caught the eye of Montgomery Miggs, who invited him to come to Washington, D.C. And in Washington, D.C., he was given a commission to do a room. It was, this would be his audition to do the committee room on agriculture. And he did this scene here, which you can see over here as well in the room, the full room, of Cincinnatus returning to the plow. Now, if you know George Washington, after he won the Great War, uh, the Revolutionary War, he went back home. He turned, became a farmer again, a citizen farmer, which he relished doing. It was only several years later that Congress said, sir, by giving up all of that power shows that you uniquely are intended to handle all of the power. And of course, we made George Washington our first president. So the first example of that type of humility was Cincinnati's returning to the plow after having great, having great victories over many invaders in Italy. So let me turn to the next uh, steam here. This is another part, uh, one of the, uh, per, uh, sorry, one of the paintings of uh, Brumidi, all frescoes, by the way. Here is Columbus lifting the veil literally off of a Native American, figuratively symbolizing lifting the veil off the new world so that we're introducing this new world to, uh, the, you know, the new world to the rest of the world after his voyage to America. Frescoes of uh, Benjamin Franklin, Robert Fulton, Brumidi did recognizing their involvement in inventions. This is over the patent room in the Capitol. So his paintings were tied to the purposes of those rooms there. Look at the work he did, the Trump Loy work, which means to fool the eye, is really remarkable. He made these walls come to life. Uh, and, you know, you can see here, this, this is not sculpture here. These are all painted images here. This is Jefferson, uh, Adams, I'm sorry, Jefferson, Hamilton, and George Washington trying to figure out where they were going to put the new capital city. Now, notice these blank panels here. These were not intended to be blank. They were intended to be finished by Brumidi. But no sooner than he started to work, some important senator said, I want you to come to my office and work on my room. There was quite a, a grab for Brumidi's talents. Uh, other work that he did. I'm going to go through these very quickly because I know I'm taking up a lot of time. Some of the beautiful rooms, this is the Senate reception room. I was able to bring people here. This room requires a key. Sometimes I was able to get that key from the Senate secretary. Uh, she knew me very well. But you can see the work in the ceilings there, these beautiful frescoes, all these allegorical figures that he borrowed from his uh, the scenes in Vatican and another Greek uh, uh, architecture as well. A lot of allegorical figures of women representing peace, agriculture, war, sciences, and the arts. This, this is probably the most notable room. This is the Senate Appropriations Room. It's still used by senators today. They sit around the table. They have name tags on each of the little name plates where they're supposed to sit. And I've been in that room several times uh, when they were discussing our budget for the Capitol Visitor Center while it was being constructed. And I would sit in one of these chairs back here. And I was very thankful that they never asked me a question about what was going on during the meeting because I was staring at the ceiling all the time. Gorgeous Pompeian style frescoes. And again, allegorical figures of women that you would pick right off the walls of the Vatican, but he instead put flags and other th things native to American uh, culture. Uh, just look at these spaces in the Capitol. This is the closest thing you have to the Vatican in the United States. Uh, and Brumidi spent 25 years painting in the Capitol. Uh, one of his quotes I love, he said, it is my lifelong ambition to make beautiful the Capitol in the one country in which there is freedom. So uh, really, the 25 years of his life until he died, he was working on the Capitol. This is my favorite room in the building because I did about 300 presentations in this room. Every Monday at four o'clock, I'd have to give updates on the visitor center. And these were paintings in the ceiling there. This was original library room in the Senate. It became known as the LBJ room it was Lyndon Baines Johnson when he was vice president under Kennedy. As you may know, the vice president is the president of the Senate. So he gets an office in the Capitol. He saw the ceiling and he said, this is my office. And he claimed it for his own. There he is in that same space there. Uh, beautiful figures showing different parts of education. Let me show you a couple of close-ups there. This shows history. There's a woman representing history. She is writing, recording history, leaning on father time there, holding the hourglass. These are some tools representing uh, ways to uh, you know, write and communicate over 
time. Another image from that ceiling there is Europe shaking hands with America as the transatlantic cable was being laid across the Atlantic Ocean, showing that connection. And this represented telegraph in that room as well. Now, these corridors are the Rumidi corridors. These are probably his most notable achievement, really remarkable when you think of the scale of them. Now, at, at times, he had 23 other artisans, most of them Italians, a couple of Germans, a couple of British men working on some of the scenes, doing a lot of the repetitive work. But Rumidi did all the fresco work in these corridors, really remarkable. And the thing I like to point out about the influence of the Vatican on Rumidi's work here, this is the corridor in the capital. This is a loggia in the Vatican. Can you see a similarity there? Uh, really remarkable. So uh, again, we're trying to create this impression that this was an important place when you came to the capital. And we wanted to create a sense of awe and uh, respect for what was occurring in this building, that when you walked into the Senate corridors, you were in an important location. Brumidi painted over three, well, he painted precisely 347 birds on the walls in the capital. Many of these were drawings based on recent expeditions in South America, the first time these birds appeared in art in any way, shape, or form. And other panels that he borrowed from the Vatican, he recreated, only he used chipmunks and squirrels and other flora and fauna native to the American uh, culture. Now, by far, his Capo Lavoro, his masterpiece, is what's in the rotunda, and that's the ceiling of the rotunda. Let's zoom in on that. It's called the Apotheosis of Washington. There is George Washington in the center there, flanked by 13 maidens. Opposite his head is this, a banner that says, E Pluribus Unum, out of many one. That was our national motto until 1953. When we were at peak tension with Russia, Congress said, you know what, there's nothing different than our Pledge of Allegiance than Russia's Pledge of Allegiance, except we're a nation under God. So let's change our national motto to in God we trust. And that's when that occurred. And that's when the words under God were added to the Pledge of Allegiance as well during the early 1950s. Now, around George Washington are Roman gods and goddesses mingling with American figures showing progress of our country. Now, it's important that, you know, Brumidi is taking these Roman gods and goddesses from antiquity and mingling them with the current figures in American history. So, again, we're just this nation country just around for now 70 years or so by 1865. But he's mingling us with Roman gods as, as if we've been around for 2000 years. Again, we're trying to create immediately a sense of importance and permanence for our country. So let's look at some of those scenes around the perimeter. They're really remarkable. Uh, here, well, actually, let me zoom in on one of them. Oh, wait, wait, I, I, I'm sorry, I, I got out a lot of turn here. I wanted to point out that this ceiling here is six, I'm sorry, 4,664 square feet. Yeah, it's really remarkable. When you think of the Sistine Chapel, that's 5,200 square feet. So basically, the rotunda ceiling is nine tenths of the size of the Sistine Chapel. What's the illusion is that it's 180 feet away. The Sistine Chapel ceiling is only about 60 feet above your heads, so it does look much grander. And another thing about the ceiling is that it curves from the center to the bottom. It's a 20-foot rise, so it is a dome within a dome there. So that gives you that 4,600 square feet. Remarkable achievement, considering he only did it in 11 months. As you may know, it took Michelangelo about four years to complete the Sistine Chapel ceiling. So I'm zooming in a little bit now, and I'm showing the first allegorical figure. That's Minerva, the goddess of wisdom. And who is she imparting her wisdom to? Benjamin Franklin, Robert Fulton, and Samuel Morse. Uh, you know, the inventor of the telegraph, the steamboat, and of course, electricity. And they're working on electrical generator here. And on her left are boys learning mathematical principles here. The next scene shows industry. This is Vulcan, the god of the forge. And behind him is a steam engine being built and cannonballs and, and other artillery as well. Then you have Cirrus, the goddess of agriculture. This one's a little grainy here. She is riding on a McCormick Reaper. So again, Brumidi is mingling Roman gods and goddesses with American inventions, more current uh, aspects of American progress. Here's Mercury, the god of commerce. He is handing a money bag to Robert, to Robert Morris, the chief financier of the Revolutionary War. This is probably my favorite. This is Neptune, the god of the sea. You can see by his trident there and Venus at his feet coming from the foam of the ocean there. And what's happening here? They are laying the transatlantic cable. You can see this cable running through their hands and through their assistant's hands there. So that's what that's representing there. Again, mingling the god of sea and there's a steam engine back there in the, in the background as well.
And there's Athena, the goddess of war, stamping out kingly power and tyranny. And at her feet are representations of not just King George, but Alexander Hamilton Stevens, Jefferson Davis, and Robert E. Lee, the head of the Confederate armies, you know, that they had just been conquested by, by the Northern armies. So in the rotunda is also another painting. After doing that painting, by the way, Brumidi was 60 years old when he did the uh, ceiling. Let me go back to that. Imagine going up 200 steps every day to get to your office without an elevator and then lying on your back or cricking your neck and trying to work on all this. Really remarkable for, you know, even if you were 30 years old, let alone 60. And then even more remarkable, at the age of 75, he works on this painting around the Primera, 300 foot frieze of American history, 19 scenes that he had drawn showing the progress of American civilization from the landing of Columbus and so forth, all the way through the Wright Brothers flight. Now, I'm going to talk about that. You're like, wait, the Wright Brothers flight, that wasn't until 1903. How could Brumidi have painted that when he died in 1880? And I'll talk about that in a minute. So there's Columbus landing. And then it moves through the explorers, Cortez going through the halls of Montezuma. Let me zoom in a little bit on that. And by the way, this was the scaffolding Brumidi used to paint that painting there. So he had to go up 90 feet to the lower tier of the rotunda, then climb down a ladder to get to the scaffolding, which slowly moved around the room as he painted. They would be moved around to be dead. Again, he's 75 years old while he's doing this. And uh, uh, unfortunately, an incident occurs that keeps him from finishing the painting. So this is his first scene showing America holding the shield, woman writing history, and this is a Native American showing the Native American roots of our country here. The next scene as we move forward shows the landing of Columbus, getting off the uh, Santa Maria, greeted by the Native Americans there. Cortez going through the halls of Montezuma. Now keep in mind, this painting was intended to look like sculpture, this kind of three-dimensional type of modeling of the paint here to uh, make it look dimensional because Congress wanted it to be sculpture, but they couldn't afford it. So they asked Bermuda if he could use his trump loy techniques, you know, that fool the eye techniques to create this three-dimensional aspect. And many people, when they walk into the rotunda, look up and they think it is sculpture and not just a flat painting there. And this is Pizarro going through the jungles of Peru, the death of DeSoto, who's buried in the Mississippi River, and then Pocahontas protecting Captain John Smith. And then the last scene Brumidi would work on, well, actually, this, I'm sorry, this is the landing of the pilgrims. And then this scene here, William Penn making a treaty with the Delaware Indians for the purchase of Pennsylvania. This is where Brumidi, unfortunately, would fall off the scaffold. Now, before you panic, he hung on for dear life. He did not fall to his death. He held on for 15 minutes and was actually rescued. But imagine hangling, dangling your feet 60 feet above the floor. You're 75 years old. That was the last day he worked in the Capitol. He said, I'm done. And he hands his paintbrushes over to Filippo Costagini, his protege. Brumidi would be recognized with a bust in the Capitol right near the Brumidi corridors as well. And a gold coin was created in his honor uh, in 2005 on the 200th anniversary of his, of his uh, death. Of, I'm sorry, of his birth. And this is John Boehner. Uh, he was the Speaker of the House at that time. Uh, Nancy Pelosi was the majority minority leader at that time. Uh, and uh, there was a big ceremony in the rotunda of the Capitol. So he finally got his due, maybe a little bit late, about 130 years later after uh, he passed away. And our architect of the Capitol curator wrote a beautiful book on Brumidi. You can look that up online and, and actually purchase that through Amazon. So I want to get back to this painting. This is the last painting Brumidi worked on. The last thing he worked on was William Penn's right foot. If you look at the Native Americans on the left here, the robes are very plain, no detail. Look at the feathers. Now look at the Native Americans on the right here. Much more detail in their robes and the garments and their, their robes and so forth, because this wasn't done by Brumidi. This was done by his protege. In fact, let me uh, block that out. So again, that's where Brumidi finished. He fell off the scaffold, hung on, was rescued, but never returned again. Costagini picks up where he left off. Now, Filippo Costagini really, uh, I think he was even more superior to Brumidi in terms of his architectural, uh, in terms of his artistic talent. Uh, again, the Indians, I think, are more uh, adroitly rendered. If you look at the figures, they're beautifully modeled. This shows the colonization of America. Again, what Costagini is doing is finishing the renderings that Brumidi had created. This is the public reading of the Declaration of Independence, showing now we're now in July 4, 1776. Now we're in 1812, the war with Britain, the death of Tecumseh, a uh, turning point in the war that gave us access to Canada. Uh, this shows, and it ended with the gold rush. 
And you see this last figure here holding a bucket on a rock there. This was the gold rush. This is where Brumidi ended his 16 scenes. The only problem was that he fell 30 feet short of coming full circle. He miscalculated. And this last 30 feet here, here's that guy with that bucket, was, it wasn't done until the 1950s, 75 years later. Other attempts were made to fill in these spaces, but Congress did not like them and they had to keep scratching off the plaster. And it wasn't until the 1950s that Alan Cox, actually, let me make a point here. Uh, Filippo Costagini said to Congress, let me finish the remaining 30 feet. And Congress said, no, you're an angry, frustrated little Italian. We don't like you. They name called him. And uh, they, you said they, they, uh, they complained that he kept asking for more money, which was warranted because he needed more supplies and so forth, especially to finish the painting. And so they fired Costagini. So Costagini goes back one day up the scaffolding and he paints himself in this tree up here. And I'm going to show you that close up here. If you look at that uh, tree there, there's a portrait there. Can you see the two eyes and the nose? That's actually Costagini's self-portrait. Even sign his name right below it there. So it was Costagini's way of saying, oh yeah, Congress, you're going to fire me? Well, then I will look down on you for all eternity. So he painted himself 50 feet above the floor there. These last three scenes were done by Alan Cox, an American artist in the 1950s, showing the Civil War handshake. There's the Spanish-American War, and then the last scene shows the Wright brother. And I'll end my presentation with this scene here, because one more Italian makes an appearance here. To his credit, Alan Cox is showing the three pioneers of aviation, Octave Chanute, Samuel Pierpoint Langley. These are the Wright brothers over here. But who is this guy on the left here? Anybody recognize that? Well, that's Leonardo da Vinci, the real pioneer of aviation, showing his first kind of model of a helicopter he had created back in the uh, 15th century. And with that, I will say grazie mille, and I will now open the floor to any questions you may have. Hi, I you all is everybody sleeping? Or <laughs> Okay, I hope uh, I hope I didn't uh, bore anyone there, but uh, and please keep in mind, I, I there's so much more. Yeah, again, you can spend a few weeks really studying all these artists, and any of you that took a tour with me knows that uh, even just the tour alone was about two to two and a half hours. Uh, so I appreciate your patience and your attention, and I'll be happy to answer any questions anyone might have. Uh, Tom, is there any estimate as to when they'll open up the Visitor Center again? Uh, you know what, I emailed my colleague a few days ago, and unfortunately, no. Uh, the Smithsonian, uh, as you may know, I've opened up their museums, the National Gallery of Art, but there's obviously, uh, it wasn't so much the COVID now, it was the attack on January 6th that put a different security uh, dynamic on the Capitol, and they're reviewing all of their policies and procedures. You know, I can tell you this, again, 16,000 people will not be entering the Capitol again any, on any day. It'll be much more limited. It, they may take an approach where it's like the White House, where people will have to reserve in advance, send in their social security numbers uh, so that there's this security protocol. Because, you know, if people are already in the Capitol having gone through a security screening process. What's to keep them from then acting out in some ways? Uh, and unfortunately, that, that little that incident on January 6th uh, has changed the whole, again, security posture of the Capitol. And so it might be. You know, it wouldn't surprise me if Congress said, you know what, we're not having people in the Capitol anymore. It's just too much of a risk. And I think that would be a critical shame. Because even after yeah. Congress said, no, that cannot happen. Let's get these doors open. Let's not let the terrorists win. And I certainly don't want these crazy people on January 6th to, you know, have changed the, uh, you know, the access to the Capitol for the American public and for, again, citizen people around the world. So that's all I can tell you right now. It's a, it remains to be seen. But I, I'm hopeful it'll be before the end of the summer. I have no questions, but I just want to thank you for a very interesting presentation. I appreciate it. Thank you. I've been to the Capitol before, and you showed me a whole bunch that I never saw before. Oh, well, thank you. Yeah, I think, uh, you know, unless it's pointed out, you don't realize how many contributions by Italian artists are there. Uh, you know, and without Brumidi, the Capitol would look very uh, different today and much more austere. Thank you, Fazio. Any other questions? Anything else about the Capitol? Any myths you ever heard about you want to hear about or, or want debunked or confirmed? <laughs> no, I just wanted to thank you too because we really, my husband and I were watching and we really enjoyed your presentation. Thank you so much.
Oh, I appreciate that. I appreciate that. And I look forward if the Capitol ever were to reopen, I still have a badge and access to the building. I'd be able to give a tour and you can see some of these things firsthand. I'd be, I'd welcome that opportunity. I'll certainly keep everyone informed, the society informed if that opportunity ever presents itself again. Mm, thank you. Sounds good. Well, again, I appreciate you all your time and attention. Very good. And uh, I, I look forward to doing and perhaps another presentation in the near future. There's some other topics I can certainly discuss that are tied to uh, the Italian contributions. Tom, is there anything new that's going on at the Capitol that was stopped because of, uh, you know, everything that happened? Uh, can you still hear me? Yes. Yeah. Okay, I, I lost my screen there. I must have hit a button by accident. Uh, anything new? Honestly, uh, well, the only thing that's new is in the Capitol Visitor Center, we have a large exhibition hall that is in the process of being completely gutted out after only 10 years because now we want to take advantage of all the new technology so that when the doors open again, if they open again, you'll have a much different experience in that exhibition hall. It's going to be much more dynamic, uh, much more interactive, although after COVID, I'm not sure people are going to want to engage with touch screens the way they used to in the past. We'll have to see, but uh, it's, a, it was a, it's an $18 million effort that's going to really change that portion of the capital experience in our exhibition hall. We Folks, attended. if you have questions, you can unmute yourself. We attended one of your tours, Tom, and it was wonderful. And we thank oh, you very okay. much and love this evening. Oh, On January 6th, was any of the artwork damaged? Do you know? No, no. I, I, I tell you, I got, uh, you know, I hadn't heard from a lot of colleagues since I'd retired, but that day I heard it from about 20 of them saying, what were my thoughts? Oh my God, how, how are you thinking? Because they knew how much I love the Capitol and to see, uh, you know, especially the thing that what shocked me the most was to see people in the Senate chamber. Unlike the House chamber where I could give a tour with permission of Congress and get a special ID, in the Senate chamber, only senators are allowed in that, on that floor and only they can escort people. People, uh, to that floor. So to see just random citizens on the floor of the Senate chamber to have that access just really shocked me and, uh, uh, you know, really was uh, disheartening. But fortunately, I understand that none of the artwork was ruined. None of the artwork was tainted or, or damaged, especially in the rotunda. Those paintings are fully accessible. No one broke any statutes. So uh, it's one fortunate thing that happened that day was the, what did happen was that there was no desecration of any of the artwork. So I'm happy to have to have heard that. Tom, this yes. is Julie from um, St. Mary's um, Italian yes. Heritage. Good to see you. Um, I did get a note from Lucio, and he is hopeful that maybe you could give a tour again for some of his um, retirement home friends yes. uh, in the future. So yes. I'm just passing that along. Um, yes. He'd like to email you. So. Oh, absolutely. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, as soon as that possibility becomes available, I'd, I'll be happy to accommodate that. In the short term, if any ever, anybody ever wanted, perhaps on a late afternoon when the sun's down a little bit, I learned a lot about the Capitol grounds. Uh, they were designed by Olmsted, who did Central Park in New York City. I couldn't give a Capitol grounds tour. Uh, I'm not sure. I'm not that, sure that sounds interesting there's too. Trees, there's historic plantings, the events that occurred there. Uh, there's a lot more than meets the eye. And I think if people were willing to do a loop around the Capitol in about an hour, uh, I could uh, do that as well. It's something to talk about, you know, to consider. Excellent. If Steve Thank you. Was going to coordinate that, you know, I, I'm, I'm retired now. I've got a lot of time to fill. <laughs> <laughs> much outside with the yard and uh, I'm looking to kill some time. <laughs> Excellent. Yeah. All right. So uh, if there's, if there are any other questions, uh, feel free to email me. Uh, uh, I, um, would uh, the, will your recording be available to us? Could we share it with our friends who may have missed it this evening? I, uh, I did record it. Okay, yes, absolutely. Uh, I, you know, <laughs> I guess I, I wish I had prepared a little bit more. I, I kind of stumbled along the way, but if you want to share it, that's perfectly fine. Well, it was fascinating. You. It was Utterly wonderful. Fascinating. Okay, great. Thank you. I appreciate that. Great. Thank you very much. We've enjoyed it here. Thank you, Kat. Thank you. you, you Tom, you are an incredible presenter, let me tell you. Um, oh, I appreciate this that. It's been fascinating, educational. Mm -hmm. um, 
And I think all of us like look forward to the day when uh, we can go to the Capitol and, you know, do some exploring and like see some of these things for ourselves and have a deeper appreciation for it. Yes, uh, you know, again, at the very least, we could maybe work on something maybe later this uh, spring or summer. Uh, if you want to coordinate that, we would all have to meet there. Uh, I couldn't provide transportation, but, you know, a lot of that exterior sculpture is still very visible. And uh, and there's a lot more in terms of the Italian influences on the architecture of the building. I didn't talk really about the dome and the uh, at all and its symbolism. Uh, so uh, I'd be happy to, uh, you know, do something even in the shorter term before the Capitol opens. Something to think about. I think you have a lot of takers here, Tom. Okay. Uh, Tom? Uh, yes. Sorry. Hi, Peter. Uh, I'm Peter here. Yes. Um, I, I wanted to uh, uh, say um, I've, I was born in the uh, district. I've lived here my whole life. And sometimes we have the saying, we only go to see uh, the sites of Washington when tourists come to <laughs> Yes. Um, and, and so I've been to the Capitol just a few times. Uh, but when I went to the Capitol and the visitor center had been completed, it mm -hmm. was such a much better experience. Um, and I want to uh, thank you for your uh, involvement in that uh, pr project. The, uh, uh, you know, sometimes the locals, we say, well, it was an expensive project. It took some time, mm -hmm. but we might as well enjoy it. Yes, um, I appreciate and, that. Uh, you know, the... I mean, the old situation with the people out in tents in the lawn. I mean, that was, as you pointed out, that was really awful. And oh. now the uh, uh, the orient the orienting film and uh, the uh, exhibition hall really gives the the visitors a chance to uh, get acquainted with the uh, capital before they're even uh, in it. It's just a, a much richer experience. And uh, thank you also for sharing that uh, uh, that mm -hmm. exhibition hall, which I enjoyed it. Um, it, yes. It's going to be even better and even more modern. Uh, it gives us right. something to look forward to. So uh, thank you again for your uh, presentation and all the uh, love of the Capitol that uh, you Well, you I appreciate you saying that. You, you said a couple of things that, you know, uh, get my, uh, trigger me when you said, you know, about how expensive it was. And it was expensive, $600 million. But I do want people to know that after 9-11 and because of other security components, there was 1,700 changes to that project. <laughs> Not to mention an extra 300,000 square feet of space that we had to build out uh, as part of that project. You know, what started at 300,000 became a 600,000 square foot facility. So it really, uh, you know, it, 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 you know, there were some changes along the way that made it a lot more expensive. And, uh, uh, but yes, it is so rewarding to see people in because I was there, I had to walk through the line of people outside at seven o'clock in the morning to get to my office. They were already online on a hot August day, you know, waiting to get into the Capitol just to make sure they would get those tickets by nine o'clock. And if they didn't get there by nine, they would be turned away and how sad it was i remember a family from idaho begging the police officer to let them in and i remember so specifically they said we're from idaho we're only here for a day we're american citizens and the officer said sorry i can't and i wanted to give them a tour myself but i had a meeting to get to that morning so yes it's very worrying to know that everyone was being received and and welcome to the capitol and we were trying to get people into the building in, until the very last minute and so uh yeah i appreciate your words to echoing that as well thank you my name is Augie Taramina. Augie. Uh, and my I name is Augusto. And I'm a skinny kid from Pennsylvania who is <laughs> an architect.